Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is The Scottish Prisoner, Episode 77, Week 9. Welcome to another week of our Scottish Prisoner podcast series. I love this book and the insight and detail it only gives that we don't see anywhere else in the Outlander books. It's pretty fun. So we'll be looking at chapter 17 and 18 today. They're relatively short chapters, so this might be the smallest episode of this series for this book. That's okay. Next week's will be a little bit longer. I think keeping to the two chapter format um, works and it's nice and tidy for us to get all the way into June. This is a very long drought lander and we're having to fill this time with doing other things. So this week, Diana Gabaldon arrived in Cape Town, South Africa to visit the set and who knows what else she's doing there. We don't know. It should be quite exciting, though, because they're doing, obviously, sea and ship scenes in the Caribbean. If you haven't read Voyager yet, there's still time. It's a pretty big book, but not as big as the next few that are coming. And I did do 26 episodes of a read-along for Voyager. It's basically six months worth if you'd listen once a week. But of course, you wouldn't have to listen that infrequently. And those podcasts are available directly on the website, or you can get it through iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher as well. Let's dive right into Chapter 17, Castle Athlone. John and Jamie arrive at the castle, and John says an ancestor of his built it, the justiciar John de Grey. No, he's not of Irish descent, as Jamie asked. He's English as far back as the conquest, and before that, they were Norman. Before that, he has no idea. Though, there is some disreputable blood in his line. His maternal grandfather was Scottish. He was from the borders. Jamie made a noise, and he doesn't much care for lowlanders, just like English. Jamie also has his own biases. It's true. And we see that Quinn isn't with them now. He said he needed to meet someone and would see them in the morning. John was highly annoyed with Quinn, who acted as if he and Jamie couldn't find their way without his help. He would find out from the justiciar where the estate was and would try not to get any more help from Quinn if possible. As they enter the castle, John notices arrow slits. He wonders if he could fit his head through. (laughs) Is John like a three-year-old or what? Huh, can I fit in there? Will my head fit through the slats on the stairs? Hey, Mom, look what I can do. Then you have to take a baluster out. Or you have to grease them up to get their head out. Yes, it has happened in my home as well when the boys were young. (laughs) John describes the ruins of the original castle that was there. It's called a Mott and Bailey. Now, I'm going to tell you what a Mott and Bailey is because I found it fascinating. I had never heard that term before reading this book originally, but I never looked it up. It didn't matter. But since I have your rapt attention, I did look it up. A Mott is a raised mound with a stone or wooden keep, which is a fortified tower. And it's on top. The Bailey is a courtyard that's enclosed and protected by a ditch and a palisade, a wall made from large wooden stakes. This type of castle became popular with the Normans around 1066 and 
Castles were built in this style until the 1200s. Windsor Castle is actually a Mott and Bailey. If you want to look and see what that looks like, there's quite a bit of information on the internet about it. These type of castles were all over Europe, and they can be found in England, Wales, Normandy, Anjou, Scotland, Ireland, the Netherlands, and Denmark. Many in England. So much was built during that time period. And the other thing of interest is the Bailey contained many different types of buildings, including kitchens, chapels, barracks, stables, workshops, forges, stores, halls, etc. Okay, that was your extra history lesson <laughs> to go with the podcast today. So back to the story. The justiciar they're going to see is Sir Melchior Williamson. He's also an Englishman. And though John and Hal didn't know him, Harry Corey did. And he included a letter for John to try and get him in to a meeting. So John sent a note to the justiciar. And it was from the brother of the Duke of Pardlow, along with Quarry's letter included. And Jamie isn't sure it's a good idea for John to announce himself and really who he is. What if they must take Cyverly by force? And John thinks about it and they discuss back and forth and they end up figuring out what exactly they want from the justiciar and what plans A and B are. I love that word. Justiciar is spelled J-U-S-T-I-C-I-A-R. I like the way it rolls. I feel fancy when I say it. <laughs> Jamie says to John, I, I'll tell we bird to lay hold of a couple of burlap bags then. What for? To wear over our heads when we break into Cyverly's house. Haven't much faith in my powers of diplomacy, have you? No, and neither does your brother, or I wouldn't be here. John assures him that Hal likes to have all contingencies covered. Sir Melchior is described to look like a bloodhound. <laughs> he's got a belly. He's kind of short. A little wary of them. He shows them around saying it's cold as charity. Damp too with the Shannon running within bowshot of the walls. A reference, again, to the arrow slits. He sneezes, saying he's had a head cold since arriving two years before. Having toured many old castles in Scotland, yes, they are not warm. <laughs> you would definitely need fires and wool, lots and lots of wool. And there's a reason people didn't walk around naked. Far too chilly, with that stone all around them. He explains that he's departing for France soon, and he's very glad they caught him before he left. And John thinks that blows plan B, which would be for him to arrest Cyverly and hand him over to John, but he's going to be out of the country. They ate a simple but well-prepared meal, and John casually worked in asking about where Cyrilly's place is. Melchior says that he'd been there once when Mrs. Cyrilly was still in residence, but when Cyrilly went to Canada, she left and hasn't returned with him. They had some kind of falling out. But he did say that Cyrilly is living quietly, but he's working on the house and had redone it recently. Sir Melchior was going to France to see his intended, who may not like castle life very much, he worries. He goes on to explain she's half English and half French. She hates Irish food, thinks the Irish even more barbarous than the Scots. Meaning no offense, Captain Fraser. None taken, sir. 
and Jamie refills his glass. The only interesting fact they really came up with about Syverly was that his father was a Jacobite. He was one of the original wild geese, the Irish brigades who fought for the Stuarts at the end of the 1600s. The castle had been very important because of its location. Here's the description of that battle. The Williamites assaulted Athlone on the west, the Conoside, but the Jacobites destroyed the bridge over the Shannon and managed to hold them off, so the Williamites bombarded the town. According to the castle records, more than 60,000 shots were fired into the town over a 10-day period. They never did take the town, but the Williamite general, a Dutchman named Ginkle, cleverly went down river a bit. The Shannon's navigable for most of its length, crossed there, and came round behind the Jacobites, flushing them out. The Jacobites were crushed, but the survivors made it to Limerick, and there took the ship to Spain. It was called the Flight of the Wild Geese. Interesting little tidbit. That should have been around 1690, I read. Cyverly's father never returned to Ireland from Spain. He died there years later. And six years prior, Major Cyverly had returned and taken over the property that was his father's. And then he decided to renovate it. And Sir Belchior says, it seems that Cyverly has inherited a large sum of money from a relative recently, and that is one of the reasons he was redoing the house. Hmm, very interesting. So Jamie, at this point, after he and John had made some eye communication, hands over a part of the translated poem to Sir Melchior and asks him if he's seen anything like it before. And of course, he'd heard of the Wild Hunt, but nothing like this account, and asks where they got it from. Jamie tells him some information, says he got it from a soldier, and he makes up a story saying he's wanting the complete work because in the future he would like to publish a book of old tales. Old tales. A-U-L-D. And John is impressed with Jamie's acting ability. And Jamie wonders if Sir Melchior might know someone familiar with these types of things. So Jamie and John together are sort of working Sir Melchior. They're working the room, and they're each playing to their own strengths. And Jamie is very good at schmoozing and getting information out of people. Sir Melchior does know somebody and tells them of a Catholic monastery on Inish Karen. It's about 10 miles by water up the Loch Ri. The abbot is Michael Fitzgibbons. Oh, yes, he is related to Myrta. He's a collector and a decent sort for a priest, Sir Melchior tells them. So you will notice in this chapter that there's much anti-Catholic sentiment, but especially after Culloden and the Jacobites. In this area, there had been a huge anti-Catholic sentiment more than other common times or more than other current times. As John said, would they ever give up? No, not when people believe in something. They're not going to give up, or not easily anyway. And they, the Jacobites saw it as a religious calling, not simply a call for a ruler It was much, much more than that. And it wasn't about a country's freedom. We can't put mix that up with, say, what's going on with the referendums, the Indie Ref in Scotland that did not pass by a small margin a couple of years ago. We can't mix it up with that. In 1707, when the Scots became part of the United Kingdom and they became part of the crown, so to speak, 
they gave up their, quote, freedom. So this has nothing to do with that. That's who they believe God ordained to be the king. And I know that's really tightening up to a small, something very small, but that's the gist of it. And while Sir Melchior is talking, John notices Jamie's face just change for a moment. He says it was like a ripple of wine in the glass, but it happened very quick. And then he caught his composure again. Jamie thanks Melchior and lifts his glass. A glass with you, sir? It's a very nice make of wine, to be sure. And that closes this little chapter. Their visit with the justiciar was useful. They gained a good amount of information as well as goodwill. And also, they got the inn to the monastery. They learned about the landscape. And they also learned where Cyberly's land was and that he indeed had been bringing in amount of money. Now, Jamie is supposed to keep John away from that influx of money, remember? Because Minnie, Hal's wife, his sister-in-law, doesn't want him getting mixed up with 12 trees. Well, I don't think Jamie's going to be able to fulfill that for her because it just got thrown right out there on the table by Sir Melchior. We'll see where it goes, but I don't think Jamie can prevent that mixing or John getting involved in it. Chapter 18, Fireside Tales. So morning comes and they couldn't get rid of Quinn. He popped up everywhere they were. And he treated John oh so kindly as if he hadn't tried to kill him a few days before. So John is having an increasing frustration toward Quinn. Number one, he knows that Quinn would just slit his throat if he could at any given time. And he says to Jamie, can you get rid of him? After discovering Quinn lounging in the yard of the stable where they'd gone to hire a mule cart for the larger baggage, Tom had arrived by coach that morning. Do you want me to shoot him? You've got the pistols, I. What does he bloody want? And Jamie just shrugs and looks stubborn, or more stubborn than usual, if that were possible. <laughs> so, what does Quinn want? And Jamie says he has no grounds to call Quinn a liar over the business he says he must do in the same area where Jamie and John are going. Does John have anything to add to that? No, he doesn't. There was nothing to do about it, and Quinn rode along with them. Because Jamie gets so incredibly seasick, they decided to ride along Loch Ree, then hire a boat to go across the Inish Kiran, and hire a boat to go across to Inish Kiran. And then Jamie would meet with the abbot and ask about the poem before they made the assault upon Cyverly's estate, which is really only a few miles from the monastery. It's at that end of Loch Ree. And Quinn wheedles his way into this as well, saying he knows the area and has his own small bit of business nearby. Of course you do, Quinn. <laughs> He's like the pebble in your sock he can't get rid of. <laughs> Man, whack-a-mole on that Quinn. It was about 20 miles they had to travel. And due to incredibly foul weather, they got within four miles of their needed location before the cart sank to its axles in the mud. We are so spoilt that unless you live rurally, our cars don't get stuck in the mud. Our carts don't get stuck in the mud, nor do our horses. 
I think we're pretty soft when it comes to things like driving rain and mud and cold and just riding on horseback. <laughs> I think we could get used to it, but it would be a big adjustment. That's for certain. And Gray had to reconsider his irritation with Quinn because he was pretty pleased that Quinn was with them because he helped them find shelter. Shelter they probably wouldn't have found themselves because he did know the terrain very well. It was in an old cow buyer and it was better than being outside, though yes, the roof leaked and it smelled of its previous occupants. But there was enough manure left around and some peat that they could make a small fire. And it was far superior than being outside. Gray also admired Quinn's ability to keep a cool head about him. Sang froid. That's another vocabulary word for this week. There's always at least one, two, or three per podcast that you can draw from and try and use in the week ahead. He acted as if they were all great friends, telling stories, joking, and remaining utterly relaxed. That is a trait to behold. And then Quinn asks Tom if he has a tale to pass the time. Tom says he's no good at tales, but he could read a bit from the book he brought. The book was from Hal's library, and it was borrowed and looked really shabby. It's called The Gentleman Instructed. This was a treatise on deportment, etiquette, and general behavior dating roughly from the year of Gray's birth. Hmm. And Gray, yes, kind of prods Tom to go ahead and read. He says, I'm sure I'll profit from a bit of elevating discourse. <laughs> and the section he decides to read about is dueling. And it should be avoided when gentlemen are involved, particularly Christian gentlemen. They should resolve conflict, and honor. Ooh. Yes. Gray thinks it must have been given to his father. There's no way his father would have purchased this. But he definitely liked this better than Tom's other normal reading. It's a book on ailments and balancing humors. Pretty gross stuff, according to John. Now, I think I would probably like the ailments book, probably better than this one. Tom reads and continues to read, and it covers what to do in the event of an armed conflict being unavoidable. And then Gray thinks perhaps his mother had given it to his father as a joke. That is something she would have absolutely done. And John was sort of dreamily listening he was relaxed, he had a full belly, and he was imagining meeting Cyverly in a duel. He thrusts Cyverly through the heart and calls him a poltroon. <laughs> and then he goes on and he starts thinking about being called out a few drunken times and there was nothing substantial or consequential. But he gives an interesting description of dueling while drunk and the advantage to it. The advantage to dueling while drunk, he'd found, was that there wasn't any sense of fear or urgency about it. It was an elevated sort of feeling, literally. He felt as though he stood a little above himself, living at a faster pace, so that he saw every move, every thrust, as though performed in exquisite slow motion, the grunt of effort, the tickle of sweat, and the smell of his opponent's body were vivid punctuations of their dance, and the sense of being intensely alive was intoxicating in itself. I mean, by that description, I'm going to go out and duel somebody. <laughs> it's a great rush. You almost get high from it. Well, you know, when you might die, and being drunk sort of doles the whole might die aspect of it. 
and John had always won, and why wouldn't he win? Interesting. That's that arrogance that comes with his breeding. He is a good soldier. He's a good fighter. He may not be a large man, but he's definitely built for that life. And then Quinn addresses Jamie. You've been out now and then yourself, haven't you, Jamie? And Gray was still distracted and had noticed that Tom stopped reading. But when he heard Quinn, it pulled him back into the reality of the room. And Gray could see an odd expression on Jamie's face. And Jamie says once or twice, he's trying to not get involved in this discussion with Quinn. In the Bois de Bologna, wasn't it, with some Englishmen? I recall hearing about it, a famous fight. Did you not end in the Bastille for it? And Quinn laughs. Now, Jamie was giving a look with, like, death rays coming out of his eyes. <laughs> Fire lasers, but Quinn didn't notice. And John thinks if Quinn had seen him, he either would have run for his life or he would have turned a stone straight away. Yeah, Death Glare 2000 from Jamie. And at this, John decides he's going to stand up and interrupt Quinn he figures there has to be a distraction because this can't go anywhere good. Not with Quinn trying to prod Jamie like a bear and he's sticking him. <laughs> and so his idea is to tell Quinn about the time that he had accidentally killed an opponent. It was a duel by pistols. And Gray regretted his opponent dying. If Gray had to kill, he wanted it to be purposeful. There's that honor again. This is where we can see some of the parallels between him and Jamie, where they are similar and they have that same mindset when it comes to death. It shouldn't be by accident. There needs to be reason and function and purpose behind it. They all listened. And that duel, the outcome of that, had sent him and Tom to Canada. And Tom wasn't at the duel, but he knew all about it, of course. He was his valet. And then John wonders, the admonition on dueling on purpose, because he remembered it. It's possible. Oh, our Tom Bird is... Not the brightest bulb in the box, but he's pretty clever on his own terms. And just as John had wanted, Quinn's focus left Jamie and was completely upon him. And John answered Quinn's inquiry of the accident, of the accidental nature of the death. And John explains he shot up in the air and the bullet came down, striking his opponent, who was bleeding but not mortally wounded. He actually walked away from the duel and he learned he died the next morning. Then later, he had received a letter from the surgeon. Apparently, his opponent had died of an aneurysm. There was a weakness in his heart. There was the shock that had killed him, not the shot itself. So it was an inadvertent death. And it could have happened under any circumstances of stress at any time. Now, my second oldest brother died from a brain aneurysm. And that's exactly what we were told, or my sister-in-law was told afterward, that it could have happened in the womb. It could have happened when he was 100 years old. Or it may have never happened. It just, that was the time that that weakness gave way. And the surgeon who had sent the letter was Dr. Hunter. 
Dr. John Hunter. Now keep your eye on that name. That name travels through all the Outlander books. It keeps coming back around and coming back around. He's uh, known as the body snatcher. He has collected bodies for dissection because he wanted to know how they work. So apparently he had taken the opponent and done a postmortem on him, an autopsy. And everyone's horrified, especially Quinn. And he's aghast at the idea of being taken and skinned like an animal. And then Gray and Tom, I communicate. There's a lot of that going on. <laughs> and Quinn is having nightmares about being skinned and strung up like a skeleton. A skeleton. And Jamie tells him if he sees a skeleton missing an eye tooth, he'll bite and give it a decent burial. <laughs> oh, I love their humor. And Quinn's like response. It's a bargain, Jamie dear, and I shall do the same for you, shall I? Though I'm not sure I should be able to tell the difference between your skeleton and that of a gorilla now. And where would you ever have seen a gorilla, Quinn? In Paris, of course. King Louis Zoo. Ooh, more threads coming together. So Quinn saw a gorilla at King Louis Zoo, and he explains to Tom how generous the king is to his subjects and allows them to see his wonderful, interesting things. Mm. Remember, Minnie was also in Paris at the time. So there's a few things that are circling. Gray is in thought again, and he wonders about the duel Jamie had in the Bois de Boulogne before the Rising. He remembers Jamie telling him during one of their Ardsmere evenings he'd been in Paris then. Mm hmm. And then John goes deep into thought about those rare evenings of conversation, humor, experience, a commonality of mind that they had shared. If he'd only had more control and hadn't made his feelings known, he cursed himself on many occasions for his bad judgment, but, or rather, and yet. And here's the description that he uses when he's thinking about this, and he looks across at Jamie. He watched Fraser through his lashes, the glow of the burning peat shining red along the long straight bridge of the Scotsman's nose and across the broad cheekbones, the light molten bronze and the loose tail of hair pulled back with a leather thong and dripping wet down his back. And yet, he thought. The act of John letting his feelings and proclivities known to Jamie broke the friendship they had. Remember in Voyager, when Jamie recounted what happened, he actually lied about a piece of tartan that was found. And in order to truly sever the relationship and anything that was there, he forced John's hand as the governor who had to lash him. That was what the law was. And so John added to the scars on Jamie's back, but Jamie had really done it to himself to fully separate the two of them. And it had completely broken the easiness they'd had together. Now, I think from John's perspective, there was more easiness than Jamie's. Again, there was an imbalance of power and authority there. Jamie always had to go back to that cell. He had moments of life and conversation and intellectual stimulation and friendship. But it was never even. It just wasn't. So they look at it differently, I think. 
even though Jamie would say they had a friendship and they were equals, if not legally, they were in other ways. So that easiness between them was gone. And Jamie's response to the knowledge of John was very bad. It was very severe. But the fact that Jamie knew meant something. Everything was not lost. The honesty between them was there. And with precious few men could John have that honesty with. So Jamie didn't have to like it. He didn't have to appreciate it. He didn't have to be interested in it. But the fact that John could simply be who he was without airs and without hiding, that meant volumes to him. And maybe that's why he doesn't let go of his love for Jamie. Maybe it's one of the reasons. Hmm. That unrequited sensation, I mean. And he notices that Quinn is now telling a tale, but he wasn't listening to it. He simply ignored it. Tom was making supper, and a hum turned into a whistle. It was a song John recognized, Down Among the Dead Men, Let Him Lie. This is a song that had been around for some time, but the words were often adapted to current trends and feelings. The pub they were at that very afternoon had patrons singing an anti-Catholic version. Jamie hadn't showed any outward offense, but his attention paid to his ale cup to hide his eyes, told John that he was offended. John knew him well enough to know his tells. Gray hoped that Jamie would not think Tom's absent-minded whistling was a reference to, but his thoughts were interrupted by Quinn saying Jamie won't be troubled. He doesn't hear music, only words. John ignored the rest, but was impressed by Quinn noticing his glance at Jamie. Him casually knowing Jamie was tone deaf completely startled him, though. While at Ardsmere, Jamie had told John he couldn't distinguish notes due to an axe blow to the head. And over much thought going on inside John's head, he concludes that Quinn and Jamie had known each other for a very long time. Because Jamie was private, wouldn't disclose that kind of information to anyone, and not someone he didn't know very long. And, and he realizes that they had to have been in France together at the same time, thinking about King Louis Zhu. And he says, or he thinks, and by the mathematical principle of equality, if A equaled B, then B equaled A. Fraser had known Quinn before, intimately, and had said nothing. So even though these chapters are short compared to some others, there's quite a little bit of meaty detail in here, and there's threads that are weaving pictures. Now, John is getting down to it, and he's seeing more of the puzzle. But what does it all mean? Well, I think he's figuring out that Quinn is a Jacobite for sure. But then what? But why had Jamie not told him? Well, Jamie already said Quinn's business was not his to share. His secrets were not his to share. So he drew that line in the sand after John disclosed he heard them talking. Jamie's not obligated to tell him. He gave him pertinent information, that's all. Why was Quinn trying to provoke Jamie with the talk of the Bois de Boulogne duel with Blackjack Randall? Now, what would the Abbot Fitzgibbons be able to tell Jamie? What does the poem mean? 
With the justiciar leaving for France, how will they handle Cyrilly without a backup plan? What is Quinn ultimately about? And then we get to see that moment where John decided everything wasn't lost because Jamie knows him and knows about him, that there's a freedom to that for John. Lots of little meaty pieces. And how in the world is Jamie going to keep the whole money thing away from John and 12 trees and everybody? It's a tangled, tangled, tangled web. And Jamie was right to feel that tug on his ankle. Hmm. Well, that's it for this week. So where can you find a drama of Outlander? On, on Facebook, it's a drama of Outlander page where you can join the private group that's only for podcast listeners. On Instagram and Twitter, it is Dram of Outlander. You can email me at adramofoutlander at gmail.com. You can call and leave a comment or question to the call-in line at 719-425-9444. Of course, the website is adramofoutlander.com. How can you support the podcast? Join me on the different social media sites. Interact with other fans, other readers, other listeners. Join in on the Wednesday night Twitter chat. It's at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern time under the hashtag ADOO. And we talk the two chapters from the prior Saturday and whatever other news has come up. And everybody gets their input. It's pretty awesome. Sometimes it's a little body and we get on little side notes there. Sometimes it's really intellectual and interesting, but overall, it's a great two hours that we spend together. Share the podcast. Tell other people about it. Post the links on your regular social media pages. And of course, you can financially support the podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash a dram of Outlander and do a monthly offering. Or if you'd like to send a one-time offering to help me upkeep, you can. And you just email me and I'll let you know how to do that. But thank you so much for coming every week and listening. I really enjoy doing this for you and interacting with you. It's really my pleasure. And if I'm going to have a hobby, this is a great one to have. And it's stimulating and it's smart. And I get to talk about characters and books that I really love. It's wonderful. So until next time, Slange of Awe.